Hello, hi. Patrick. Hi, Kate, and hi, Make It British community. Thank uh, you for joining us today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope the sound is working okay. So, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, would you like to start by telling everyone that's watching a little bit about Furious Goose and, and what you do? So Furious Goose is um, a relatively new uh, luxury accessories brand based in Britain. Um, we, we like to think of ourselves as a bit of alternative luxury, um, offering something slightly a bit edgier, um, but all with the highest quality and all um, manufactured here on, in these aisles. Um, and yeah, so it's two years old currently. We've been trading for about just two years. So, uh, And I'm the lead designer and director of the company. So. And your background originally was not in textiles, was it? No, not at all. I mean, like, I think the brand has actually been uh, bubbling away, sort of part of me since I was a little kid, actually. I mean, it's, I, I, I was always looking at flowers. Apparently, my mum said in the pram, I was always drawn to colour. And then I did art at university, so fine art. Um, and actually, so my degree was in the fine art printing, so etching and lino cuts and that sort of thing. And then actually I graduated, there's really not much call for etchers. I, I, I needed cash, so I became a graphic designer. Uh, and I, it's a great career. I've been doing that for 15 years. Uh, and that was the precursor to the brands. And all of that kind of art and graphic design sort of led to the creation of Fu Furious Goose. And, and our sort of uh, our actual signature style is a sort of fusion of all those influences. So I've got to ask then, where did the name Furious Goose come from? Because I know everyone else is going to be thinking that. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like the name, when you create a brand, it's it, it's quite often you get stuck on the name. And I was looking for, for months and months and months. I think it's quite important to uh, let the brand, you know, discover your brand first and then name it afterwards. But I was I was up in Edinburgh with some friends and, and her mother was... Uh, we we're all a bit merry and she was recounting tales of this furious goose that no one could ever catch and no one dared kill and so it lived for, throughout her entire childhood. Uh, Christmas was no threat to this goose and every time <laughs> she did it we were just falling about laughing and I, I thought god it has such a poetic ring to it, it's funny, it's memorable and it, you know then I could retro engineer it to fit my brand values as well so it was, it was absolutely perfect. And there is certainly a lot of humour to your brand isn't there? Um, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I I think in luxury accessories are, are often so sort of serious, or or um, they they hark back to a golden age of something or other. And and actually, you know, with digital printing and and current, you know, we live in the modern world. You can you can really have a laugh with with um, with you know a little bit of humour, a little bit of curiosity, a talking point, something a bit risque. Um, but for us, it's always comes down to the design has to be absolutely spot on. It can't, there's a terrible word, um, wacky. And, yeah. Uh, that is just, uh, it, it would, <laughs> or zany is even worse. <laughs> you said risque earlier. You told me a bit of a funny story um, when we spoke yesterday about your first UK manufacturer that you work with. Do you want to tell me? Oh, everyone? yeah. Well, I mean, when I started uh, designing, I knew I wanted to do accessories and I thought, maybe let's do something a little bit out there to um, to catch the attention of the market. Uh, and, you know, being in Brighton, it's a little bit of a naughty town. That's where we're based. So I thought I'd um, do a slightly risque design based on the, the female anatomy. Let's <laughs> uh, it's very, very tasteful. I've got it with me. Have I you got it? Let's, yeah. let's see it. Let's see it. <laughs> um, it's um, a lovely... A lovely design that. Yeah, you can't really. It's a, yeah, it looks like it's a print very design. Very tasteful. And when you wear it, obviously. Oh, who's fantastic colours, lovely colours. Yeah. So what happened when you yeah, took so that to the manufacturer? Just, unfortunately, the, the printers didn't actually know what it was. <laughs> and they had a really strange um, method where they used to sell seconds to reduce the price of yeah. your overall purchase. And when I, I suddenly, I thought, I have to tell her because I suddenly got a bit worried. They're quite traditional. And she was <laughs> pretty horrified. She, she took it on the chin, but she said, listen, I just, you know, I, any more risque than this and our girls, we just can't get to say it. <laughs> <laughs> be 
judged by your printer. It's just, it was my first ever foray into design for fashion. I thought, gosh, have I really got this wrong? But, <laughs> oh, I love that. That's, that is British manufacturers through and through, though, isn't it? That's why we work with them, because they're all a little bit quirky. And um... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, luckily, my, my new uh, printers at the moment are from Macclesfield. Mm. A little bit uh, less uh, prudish, let's put it that way. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. So um, why did you decide to make the product in the UK? Because you could have had it printed, printed in Italy or China. Yeah, I mean, it's for me, Made in Britain is a, a, a few things, but actually it's, it's not about patriotism for me. Mm-hmm. It's actually about pra- pragmatism. Uh, I, you know, I setting up a new brand, I can't afford to go to Italy. I'd love to. But I can't afford to go to the factories to check the print quality, to talk to the people. And there's always a language barrier. So Yeah, that's so true. So definitely from the beginning, I thought I have to do this in Britain, you know, for, yeah. for my own financial reasons. But I needed to get the product absolutely spot on. And the designs are very unforgiving because they're very crisp vectors. Yeah. Uh, I'll show you another one here. It's a good case in point. It's, there's no soft edges to the colour. It's just sharp kind of design. And, and that to get that right, you need yeah. to talk to basically your printer has got to be spot on with that yeah exactly they? yeah exactly so do you go to, when they have um finished your product do you go there to sign it all off and check the quality no we tend to post strike offs back and forth right okay and i have a meeting i come up and see them once or twice a year so yeah. it's not too far but um and yeah again i just couldn't do that certainly not in china and no. even in europe i find it hard yeah so um for me, it's it's fantastic that, I mean, it's great to support British business as well. And the Macclesfield, where they're printed, there's, there's these wonderful old mills. And yeah. and um, my printers have saved one of these mills. So it's just uh, it's nice to be part of that story. Yeah, that's fantastic, really. And um, as far as um, with the manufacturer, the one you're working with at the moment, how did you find them? It was a bit, it was actually serendipity. I mean, a lot of... The story of Furious Goose has been happy accidents. Yeah. And um, I, uh, my scarves are all hemmed in the UK as well. And I use um, a couple of lovely people. But one of my uh, London-based hemmers, seamstresses, I, I'd had some results that weren't perfect from another um, supplier. And I, I, just thought, I just thought, gosh, I'm going to just speak to her and yeah. ask her. And she said, oh, nobody ever asked me questions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay so she's really pleased I just asked her and um and um yeah the printers had just uh set up in Britain and she'd encountered them so she put me um in to, uh, said just get in touch and I was one of their first clients in the UK so all right brilliant and are the yeah. edges on your scarves hand rolled or machine stitched yeah yeah they're all hand rolled right so do you want to explain to people because that is very special indeed isn't it so can yes. you explain to people who might be watching who don't know the difference and why yeah. hand rolling is so expensive, how well, it all works. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, as I said, I've only been doing this for two years and I, as I moved from graphic design to just accessory design, I wasn't really aware of this at all until I, I got my first piece produced and then I started looking closely. I thought, gosh, it has to be hand rolled. It, it, all luxury clients expect it. And the reason they do is it shows that, that individual attention to detail, but it helps with the wearing of the fa- the scarf. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see it. I'll try and put it up to the camera. <laughs> there we go. We, yeah, we can see it. Hold it still. Yeah, so it's about one hand done stitch, about every, what, eight millimetres? Yeah. And amazing that they loop the fabric so you can't you can just see the tiny bit of the stitch. And yeah. it's a durable hem. But it gives a little extra weight to the scarf, so it drapes very nicely. And it just gives that slight, you know, I don't know it's hard to quantify, but a luxury feel because it's got, it, the machine is so regular. It just has this little, even if it's, it's very neat, yeah. it has that hand-finished sort of quality to it. And do you know how long it takes your ladies, oh, I've, I've been sexist there, I'm assuming they're ladies, oh. <laughs> um, how long it takes them to do one scarf? It, so they're pretty good at it, I think. You know, they... they um, uh, Matilda really that's what she does so she, yeah. she I think she watches TV when she does it actually really? <laughs> so she can do it without even looking that's yeah. really it, impressive I it's, it's, it's um I think it's anywhere between half an hour for a large scarf so really? it's, it's concentrated there and I think that's what you know I had a look on how to do it I tried it totally couldn't do it at all it's yeah. so 
well, so it's very hard to do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a rare skill in Britain at the moment. It is indeed. In fact, that's interesting. So half an hour per per scarf. And if you think about what the hourly rate is in the UK and, and someone's sitting there doing that, that's just the cost of doing the edge and when yeah. people turn around. So do you think obviously your customers appreciate the fact that you've got a luxury product there? I mean, who are your typical customers? Yeah, I mean, I think they do. I think when I set up the business, I had a really lovely, um, again, just chance. I saw a seminar in London um, by a company called uh, Utelier. Oh, yes, who, um, I know. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I popped a light. It was called Pricing for Profit. Yeah. And uh, I, if I hadn't been to that, I think I would have gone, come very undone uh, <laughs> later really? down the line. And it, they, yeah, so the whole takeaway from that was to price at the higher end. Yep. Correct. Raising yeah. prices is so impossible. Re- reducing prices is much easier. Yes. And to factor in all these details and to um, the, use a, a simple uh, equation to get to your final cost price. Uh, sorry, your final RRP. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, at the beginning, went high. Um, and so my client base always was going to be the, the sort of higher end of the market, people who don't see spending £300 on a scarf as yeah. Uh, and there's a bit of fun and the pocket square at 65 pounds you know isn't a big deal so it, it and if you aim high then you know people are willing to spend that if they know it's made in Britain if they know the quality is there um it, it works so brilliant well that's really good and that's definitely wise advice very wise advice because I always say to people go in at the higher end because especially if you want a wholesale it's very difficult to mark the product down uh, yeah. Sorry, it's very difficult to mark it up again or to sell your product that you're selling direct to the customer at a different price that someone might want to sell it to in a retail store once you've wholesaled it. So people Absolutely. come a cropper when they've gone in too low and then they find someone that wants to wholesale it to sell it to the same price and then they've lost all their margin altogether just to get yeah, the wholesale yeah, business. You've got to very early on decide, are you going to be wholesale only, yeah. online only, or, or this hybrid, which is what we've gone for, which yeah. is... Actually, if you can get that to work, it's it's in, it's the best of both worlds, basically. So, and you've got some very impressive wholesale customers, haven't you? Um, tell us about about those and how you how you've managed to get your wholesale customers. Well, I mean, as I said, we've only been going for two years. So, I mean, the first and, and the year a, a bit of time before that was getting the product right. So, in twenty seventeen was when we really started um, approaching retailers, and um, again by just by chance. I had a few meetings. I, I spoke to um, Anderson Shepherd, the tailors, because yeah. um, I, I actually thought I had a name to drop. And so I had some confidence to call them up. And I went in there, dropped the name, and they were like, who? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but I was there. So, you know, you carry on. And it turned out they, they the products weren't for them. They only sell their own products. Yeah. But um, they, yeah, they, they loved it. And they said, you have to go down to William and Son. Yeah. And say that I sent you. And so I went down there. And um they again they, they, they love the quality. They were they found some of the designs too modern. But I'm very keen on working collaboratively with um my suppliers and my retailers. So I, I developed a range for William and Son. Oh um, brilliant. They're very based. So they're they're on Bruton Street, right opposite Hermes flagship amazing stuff. amazing uh, yeah that premiere is incredible within well done. You know, the first year in the window opposite Hermes <laughs> but that's because you had the balls to get out there and start approaching them didn't you yeah I think well I mean I was confident I mean, I, it took me a while to get the product right and to have yeah. that confidence and honestly with, when you've got you go into those pitches and your products are great they, they do the talking for you yeah so, yeah so that was that was one that was a great coup and I work closely with them and they have press days and it's really fantastic for my brand and then uh out of the blue through Instagram I, I got a really amazing um interaction with uh, Isetan in, in Tokyo which yeah, um, is, yeah. and for people that don't know that are watching Isetan is um probably the biggest department store isn't it in Tokyo and have a huge selection all the designers have a scarf collection in there don't they yeah absolutely and, it, and they have this specific store for menswear it's a town men's which is eight stories of 
amazing kind of I think you can have your katanas sharpened and your kimonos yeah. mended. this is I, I I haven't been there you've not think, you've you got know, to go <laughs> I've been several times you've got to go yeah I have to go there, but um but yeah that was just through Instagram I mean Instagram's been fundamental to growing my retail um outlets across the world actually and and it's really you know that's a game changer to be yeah in the in town. It, it gives you so much kudos and clout when you're approaching other retailers so. and how have you found dealing with the japanese or do you deal with someone in between or does, do you have to sit in the meetings with japanese people yeah it's i mean absolutely fine the, the, we've got um two buyers well i met the fashion director first he's absolutely lovely and then um he sent the the buyers for pocket squares and ties they have specific I buyers i love it they've got to buy just for pocket squares yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> it's it's very neat but, um, and uh, yeah, I've met with them twice now and, and it, they are great. I was a bit disappointed though because I wanted the Japanese business meeting etiquette, you know, the etiquette. Yeah. I read up all about with it. With the hand in like, cards with, yeah, with two yeah, hands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything, I knew my etiquette yeah. like, the back of my hand. <laughs> and um, I think because they're, you know, they're fashion guys, they're like, they, they don't do that. They're very Londonized. Yeah. 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 Well, in the end, I had to ask, can we do the business card thing? Oh, did you? <laughs> brilliant. And you mentioned your Instagram there. I think your Instagram is brilliant. And, and for any small British-made brands who are just starting out, who want to get an idea of you know, how to do Instagram well, I think yours is really good. I really enjoy your Instagram stories okay. in particular yeah. because you let your personality come through, which it does as well in your work, but particularly in your stories. If someone wants to find your Instagram, what is the Furious Goose Instagram name? Yeah, it's just Furious Goose. So, right, so Goose. I'll put a link alongside this video afterwards for all of you. How else can people find you as well online if they if they want to find all your products, Patrick? Yeah, so obviously the website is furiousgoose.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, and then Instagram is the main one. And my Facebook page is again at Furious Goose. So those Fantastic. are the main things. Twitter, I'm afraid, is uh, not, not working for me at the moment. But... What's not working for you? Twitter. Twitter, yeah, I think a lot of people are struggling with Twitter. Twitter works well for us, but that's because we're business to business a lot of the time. Um, so for making and British, we've been, and yeah, like that. and we've been yeah. on it for so long. But I think for a product business like yours, I'm hearing that Instagram and Facebook. Have you started doing any Facebook lives yet after this, Patrick? Because maybe you should. Well, I mean, it's, it's going so well. So. You're gonna have to. You're definitely gonna have to start doing your own. Definitely, I yeah. shouldn't be the only person doing these on a weekly basis. Shall we have a look and see if anyone's got any questions for you? Let's have a look because I can see there's comments coming in. Connor, Connor Hughes says, "Woo." Fantastic. Um, Is he a friend of yours? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So he's joined us. Let's have a look. Who else? This is, I'm trying to see my... Um, Matt McGuire says, great stuff. Patrick, Natalie Robbins is uh, lots of emojis and well done signs. Um, Charlotte Johnson says, hi. Isabel Randall, hello. She says, hi. Um, and Roslyn Whiting and Ross Barr has joined us as well. Now, do you know Ross? Because I'd imagine um, that your products have a similar customer. He does knitwear, a men's knitwear oh, brand. Yeah, yeah, no. So you should definitely uh, catch up with Ross because definitely a similar customer there. So if anyone is watching and does specifically have a question for Patrick, then do put it in the comments. There's a bit of a delay. Um, Patrick, is there anything else you'd like to say? Maybe... Um, what you you're obviously you're a member of Make It British. What to you has been the best thing about being a member? Uh, it's basically being able to contact people through the group. And, yeah, um, I think we had a chat about umbrellas, and you know, just if there's anything because I I in the future, I mean, I'm currently focusing on the accessories and, yeah. and fashion. But uh, further down the line, once I've established a brand, I would, I'd like to move it into homeware yeah. and surface design. I'm really keen on umbrellas. I've always thought on a rainy day, you know, what better opportunity to brighten up the day than have something fabulous on the on the uh, the umbrella fabric. So Plus the Japanese, the Japanese love umbrellas. I seem to remember Isatan Department Store, which you're in with your pocket squares, has also got a huge floor just of umbrellas, of printed oh, umbrellas. Because they all, love yeah. an umbrella in yeah, Japan. Yeah. 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 Who else have we got here? Sean says... Um, does Patrick think that being a British brand has a degree of premium mark to sell overseas? And do you think the fact that you're British made and you're a British brand has really helped you get those overseas accounts? 
Yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, I was um, even asked this question directly to Isatan on Wednesday when I had my meeting, and they yeah. they totally confirmed that. They said it, it it adds a great weight to the brand, but it also it's not just the kudos we get that kind of premium tradition. We also get the license to be quirky, um, yeah. which is really fantastic for me because uh, um, my the whole brand for me, I mean is about that that of freedom to be quirky, to be curious, to do things slightly differently. And that that's all part of the British brand, the sort of punk yeah. aesthetic yeah. Um, has freed up our brands to do things that American brands just can't get away with. And, you know. Well, we've got the design as well as the manufacturing, I always like to think. Yeah. Brands always, yeah. Um, out of interest, do you put made in England, made in the UK or made in Britain in your products? I put made in UK because it's shorter. Right. Uh, and it fits on a little uh, woven label. Yeah, those labels. And um but also I have uh you know, I have products made in Scotland as well. So oh, some of, right, yeah, yeah. I don't want to limit it just but I mean made in England does have an even more traditional kind of feel to it. But um yeah, so I go with made made in UK just for Yeah, that makes short. sense. Interesting. Right, have we got any more questions? Have you got anything else you'd like to tell everyone, Patrick? This is your chance. Open mic. Anything else everyone should know? Or if anyone is a no, British no, brand, no. is there any, yeah. if anyone else is a British brand and is watching in or is thinking of taking the leap from a different career into setting up a British-made brand, what advice would you give them? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's been a fantastic change. And, and um, I think it's to, to listen to your heart about what you want to do. And before you um, don't just choose a name and then try and fit your brand into or choose a product and fit yeah. your, you have to sort of think about what you want to do I really wanted to come back to my creative roots and and so I was looking for something and it took me a while to think well actually accessories is, is the perfect thing for me uh, and then I then I was working on the personality of the brand and I wanted it to reflect my personality yeah and it was only after I got those things in place that the whole brand started to coalesce and then I realized that that's what I wanted to do. And it means that everything I've done since has fallen into place with almost, well, not effortless, quite a lot of work, <laughs> but it's, it, there's been no kind of confusion on the brand or where I'm going with it. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting thing in, in Greece when they name a baby, they, they, they don't name it for a year. They, really? <laughs> ah, interesting, and right. You know the character and then you name it. Yeah. <laughs> I probably should have done that with my event because um, <laughs> we've obviously got the – my business is Make It British, but the event is Meet the Manufacturer, which is a bit of a, what it does on the tin name. I now yeah. hate that name, and actually we're making a bit of an announcement next week, and this is also oh, the first yeah. time I'm saying this, um, to say that it's going to be called something else because I hate the name Meet the Manufacturer now, and I should have taken your advice and um, and done something else with it and um, at the start. So, uh, But it's difficult to have a, an event without a name. That's the product. That's the, that's the problem. So we have any more questions? No. Patrick, right. thank you very much for joining us today. You've been absolutely fantastic. A really special guest. Um, good luck with everything. I will put the links to all of your, uh, all the places everyone can find you and Furious Goose along with this video. And this video will also be published on YouTube. And we've actually now going to be putting videos on YouTube on a week weekly basis, which are from these interviews. So I will put that link there too. Right. Thank you very much for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.